do it though. It should be the whole of the law. Um, hi, Misty. How you doing? Um, I'm going to try to make a really uh, easy video for you to understand about REBT. REBT is very effective therapy. Um, it was taken over by CBT. Certain psychologists watered it down, changed it into something else that's not. Um, CBT doesn't do the same thing as REBT. It removes part of it. So it's important to return to REBT. What does REBT mean? Well, it's rational, emotive, behavioral therapy. It's rational because, and, and hold on, hold on. I just want it's, to say one thing. It's really strange because me and Mark both had this training um, right. at, different, at different times in our lives. So I knew exactly what Mark was talking about when me and him got together. And so I know that this works, and and it's it's something though that we're always constantly working on. Right. It, it's not something that we're ever going to be perfect at. I mean, it's that just a way hell. to change the scenario. Yeah, we both do. We both been sick for. I've been sick like for two weeks. <laughs> I've been sick for almost two weeks, so I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't look very well, but um. um yeah. Uh, let's, Let me go check on your mom. So. Um, let's get into this a little bit. Okay, so it's rational because we have control over it. We have the ability to think. And it, and this this therapy uh, ha requires that we do the thinking. So let's say we have an activating event. From that activating event, we develop a belief from it. And... That there are consequences to that belief. That that's a very simple explanation of how our thinking works. There's a stimulating event. There's a bunch of beliefs or interpretations or things that we internally believe based on that event that cause a consequence. Okay. So let's break this down a little bit. Our beliefs that we're seeking out are beliefs that are, are irrational. So when we sit down and we ask ourselves, well, what do we believe? What do I believe? Okay, what we're going to look for is absolute words. Absolute meaning uh, it ought to be this way. It must be this way. It should be this way. And these words are key words to identify an absolute irrational belief, okay? And it's like the idea with an, with an, irrational, with an irrational absolute belief, it's a demand. It's a demand. If it's not like this, then it disturbs us, okay? this belief disturbs us. The, it must be this way or my life is going to be horrible and I won't be able to bear it. That's an absolute belief right there. So we have to look at these things. And we have to take control. We have to say, no, I don't demand this. I prefer it. But I can accept life if it's not like this way. And what happens is you take the you take back the power you take that power to the, the, that this demanding thing this absolute belief that we've imposed upon ourselves you take the power back and then you're able to look at it you look at the belief and you make it a preference and you you ask yourself well how does that make me feel now that I've changed that. How do I feel right now? How does it make me feel that I've changed that belief? Now, I can tell you, I've changed. I've done this over and over and over again. It always creeps back in. It's a part of our mental architecture to, to have these types of beliefs, to disturb ourselves through these beliefs. And a lot of people aren't aware of this. You know, they blame it on other people. 
It's really not other people. It's how we perceive other people. It's not people, places, and things that disturb us, but how we view people, places, and things that disturb us. And it always comes back to these irrational beliefs. And it goes very deep. It goes very deep. It can go as deep as you want. Okay, so now that we've changed this belief that it has to absolutely be this way, it must be this way. No, while it needs to be this way, um, I would prefer it to be this way. Uh, but it's, it's not rational for me to think that everybody is going to be that way. And so if I continue with this belief, I set myself up to be disturbed, to be upset, to be angry. Anger is, is, is a masking emotion. If you're angry all the time, it's because there's something underlying it that's masking that it's it's that anger on the surface is masking what's really going on so it could be disappointment we're disappointed in ourself well the anger which is projected to other things rather than rationally how we are dealing with it can cause us not to see the emotion that's really the problem that's that's really what's causing the behavior so this is important in the sense that you are digging um, to determine what the real feeling is and the root of the belief of that feeling okay so let's say you change everything your emotion changes now you realize that it's always been disappointment. It's always this belief that it has to be this way has been due to so many disappointments in your life. The activating event is you believe in somebody and you're, you're encouraging them in your life and they do something to disappoint you. Okay? Well... Rather than use this disappointment like most people do as, okay, well, I should feel guilty because I feel disappointed in what this person has done to me. Instead of doing that, look at the root of that disappointment and say, listen, I, this is disappointing me. And I can use this as a, this disappointment can be used to motivate. I need to establish boundaries in my life. I can't just assume that people are going to believe the same way that I believe or that they're going to have rational beliefs. If I have irrational beliefs, they certainly have irrational beliefs. So what I need to do is I need to set these boundaries and say, listen, you disappointed me by doing this. You're, you're disappointing me, disturb me. It hurt me. Okay? I'd like you to please change this behavior. I'd prefer you to change this behavior. Or if this person is not changing their behavior, then we have to change the thought. Because I think a lot of what you're or, saying is, is that he doesn't care, so he's or, not changing. Or, hold on. Or we can use this as a motivation to for our own self. Not directed at this other person. This is still about us it's still these setting these boundaries these expectations a lot of people say well you shouldn't have any expectations i disagree with that i love myself i have expectations yeah you damn right and expectations are healthy okay <laughs> exactly expectations are healthy there's nothing wrong with having healthy expectations and if being you... able to express that those healthy expectations will do a lot to deal with these irrational or absolute beliefs. Once we see that if we do tell somebody, I have this expectation, and they truly value us, they're gonna change their behavior. 
They're going to recognize, hey, I'm not just crazy. Hey, uh, you can't just peg me into a label where I'm the problem anymore. You also, meaning the person who I'm, who's, who's, who I'm uh, uh, reacting to through my belief, my irrational belief in this event that I talked about, okay, I'm looking at it from my standpoint, but now when I state my expectation, I've just told the other person how I feel. So I've gotten to the root of the issue. I'm, it's, I'm not masking it through anger anymore. I realize that my real emotion is that I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in myself because I've allowed this to happen. I'm disappointed in the world because the world shouldn't be this way. See, absolute belief. The world shouldn't be this way. That's a really big disturbing belief. When we think that our beliefs can control the world on that level, where we can impose it on other people, it's just going to disturb us more. We have to be more rational. We have to look at it from our standpoint. Try not to try not to get hung up on blaming other people or blaming people, places, and things. It's the activating event. Any activating event kicks in this belief. This belief might be rational or irrational. If it's irrational, it's going to disturb us. Now, this is a subtle disturbance. We don't know what's really disturbing us. We don't know it's this irrational belief that's disturbing us. We just know that we feel when something happens and it's similar to that original activating event, that belief kicks in again. And we feel the same way about a different situation that we compare to the previous situation. So once we identify what the, the, the feeling is, now we can see how it makes us behave. People control us through our behavior. They, uh, they don't look to help change why, what's causing this behavior. They don't care. They seek to punish or whatever because they don't understand you. They don't understand why you're behaving the way you're behaving. But now you know your behavior is connected to your beliefs. This is a big one because uh, when I first started my path, um, I had been through REBT. I had been trained in it. And for some reason, it... it I, I, um, it never rose to in my consciousness that my my beliefs and my emotions were connected to my behavior. I always had a separation between my belief and my emotions and whatever this abyss was to my behavior, I never looked at it as it's me. This is important because it gets to the root of cause and effect. It takes back our power. They don't want us to learn this because in five minutes you can address something that's deep irrationally. You can address it and you're no longer disturbed anymore. You don't need 20 years of therapy. Right. You only need five minutes. Of, of, of evaluating the situation right. yourself in the proper way. So, okay, I don't like, okay, okay, here's one. My mother-in-law, we moved her into the building to help her. She was getting evicted. She now bangs our door every time she comes down from the third floor to go to her car, and she bangs our door every time on the way up. So, yeah, so, so, what we have is we have 
constant bombardment into our life. So I don't like this situation. So we had an agreement that we were going to have respect for each other and we were going to call before we went. Now I just went upstairs because I know she was at the hospital <coughs> at the doctor and uh, she hasn't answered her phone this morning and she's an old woman so I was concerned for her health. So I went upstairs to make sure she was okay, which she has walking pneumonia. She's not okay. But I don't think any of us are okay. No, we've all been very sick. And the whole saw, town has got And we saw the pneumonia. doctor, and the doctor said everything is cleared up, and it's That's, just going to go it's away. It's not. And it's been going on for a whole other week. Right. You know? So um, so where we are here is, is that, okay, I don't like this situation. So now I've got a woman who feels entitled to bombard our lives and dump all of her sadness or drama or whatever because she's an energy vampire. So I've got to set boundaries with this woman. And it's not just her. Uh, everybody are energy vampires. It's this whole family. It's disgusting. And so what we've got to do is, is we've got to set boundaries. I just removed my sister-in-law from my page since you can't see what I post. I post, I, I can't really post the way I want to post because my page is being spied on. So I can't talk about anything that I really feel, which is really frustrating to me because it was an outlet for me for a long time and I can't use it anymore. Um, I don't know who on my page is a real person anymore or if it's a fake profile that's my stepdaughter's mom. And I just blocked a person that I think was constantly liking my shit because I think it's his his ex baby mama. He thinks it is too. I, how the hell am I supposed to know who's real? How am I supposed to let people in our school and not see them on a video? Well, originally that's what we did. That's why we had everybody come on video. And pe and all the ones that wouldn't come on video got thrown out. They didn't come in. They didn't come in because. And we got the a quality group because we knew who everybody was. Right. I could trust to talk. I mean, I know you're you. You've been with me since way before her. I know you're who you are. Right. You know, I know Jeff is who he was. I've known him for a long time. Joe Rebel, I'm not sure. Um, I know he is. He does have a picture of himself, but he says nothing anymore. Nothing. And it's like... You can see from things that they're posting that they are uh, in conspiracy with the enemy, you know, um, who wants to steal Mark's work and say that we're stealing his, and it's it's crazy. So we don't know who we, we, and we we've got posts where he says he's going to destroy us online, yet right. then he's coming down here bringing pizza and beer because he's trying to get in our door because he can't teach magic, he can't teach the information. If we're not giving it to him, because he doesn't have anything new. Right. He needs us for the new material. Still talking about the same thing from 20 years He's ago. He's talking predator prey. Well, we don't live according to predator and prey. We live according to love. So, um, we don't want a life of predator prey. Right. You know, and, and this is the thing. So, I have to come up with a way in a script to my mother-in-law. I have to say, look, if you knock on my door and you haven't called, I'm not going to answer the door. And neither am I. We're not going to do it anymore. Now, I've already done this. I've already said on the phone before they even moved in the building. Right. I said, if you're going to try to get a hold of me, please call me. <laughs> now, it may be that she's doing this because in the past I'd, I'd been disturbed and I wouldn't answer the phone. For, month, for a week, for two weeks, three weeks. Because of whatever his ex-baby mama was doing. So, but it's different now. I do answer my phone. I have it plugged in, I keep it charged, I generally try to have it ready if somebody calls. It's the phone that I use. So there's no reason now why she needs to live and, and, and behave based on how it was in the past. Right. So, so this uh, is another part <coughs> I mean, of we'll the irrational. we'll be in the middle of, of doing what we do, <coughs> and then she comes down here, and then she <coughs> complains to me that she's not going to let Mark 
show her all this stuff. Well, this is what we were doing and this is our home and if you're not interested, then please leave because this is what we're doing. And I don't want her coming down here interrupting our studies and our researching and our book reading that we like to do together. This is how we live. This is what we do. This is our life. They are destructive. Um, you can see behind you. You can see over there. You can see a stack of information. That's all stuff that I've copied, researched, written, written myself. Bookshelves everywhere. In the I've house. got a stack over here. You know, I'm not saying this to try to convince you. I'm just telling you that's the really how it is. And so, for the longest time, this individual got information from me or ran ideas through me. And I would, and my personality type allows me to break it down and systematically show and show him what can be done to improve it. Or now, why it won't work. Right. Now, um, that became a source of power for individuals that felt they didn't need to do the work. All they needed was my writings or all they needed was to have me critique them and realign them. And it became extremely unhealthy. You know, my writings ended up with other people and, you know, people thought that they could just take my, my ideas and reword them and it doesn't work that way. I mean, I'm not to get off the point, but I'm reading a book on communication right now, and it's an amazing book, but it shows how this is important. This REBT is important this is because we have, a, we have a breakdown in communication. They use this breakdown to control us, right. to tell us what we should think how we should think about something. Now, an example with an REBT, okay, you have the activating event, the belief of the event, and the consequence. This is, they called it the ABC, so it would be very simple. But there's also a D, which is to dispute it, to dispute this, this belief now. Once again, once you've gone through it, you dispute it again. And if it doesn't work and you're not behaving the way you think you should be behaving. I mean, you could start out your sentence like, then, then, I feel sad because he doesn't hear me or he says he's going to change doing this and then he doesn't. And then you have to come up with a new belief or a new way to do do it. And then that will, in effect, change the fact that you feel sad. So all, I right. would almost recommend, I feel sad, I feel irritated. I feel aggravated that people don't respect us enough to call rather than just bang our door the way they do. So, you know, for me, so I don't hurt her feelings, what I'm gonna say is, I'm not going to answer my door if you don't call first. I would like when you come over here to <coughs> have quality time. So we would like you to come have dinner with us a couple of times a week. Or lunch with us a couple of times a week. And have some quality time. And not this, what I feel is very disruptive to what we're doing, behavior. Right. Change the pattern. We've got to change the pattern. So... I'm going to let her know. Listen, we wanted you here because we want time with you, but we don't want you here every day. We don't want you here in and out three, four times a day. Um, Just because we live in the same building. Right. We we want we wanted you here so that we know you're safe. We wanted you. We want you here. We like the fact that you could come down and have dinner with us a couple times a week. Um, but we want you to respect our space in the meantime. And we don't need to be spreading the love of viruses and flus and pneumonias back and forth. You know, so if we're sick, we need to both stay away from each other. Because we got you sick this time, and you've gotten us sick many times. And we don't need to be doing that either. So we're going to have to set some boundaries. I've got to figure a nice way to say it. I think she's going to get offended no matter how I say it. 
She's going to take it personal. I'm concerned about that. I don't know if she's going to take it personal. I think that if we address it from what we're talking about, see, this is the thing. RBT is not designed to deal with other people, people, places, and things. It's, it's based on dealing with how these people, places, and things, how we see these things disturb us. Right. If we go back to, um, uh, let me see, where is it? Well, okay, if we I'm go back to- I'm disturbed because I feel disrespected. If we go back to the Arizute, in the very beginning, I talk about how I constructed this. Be careful, sweetie, you're, you're shaking the table. Yeah, I was. I'm bouncing the baby. Look how and she's playing. probably going back and forth. <laughs> if you could see him, he's all sprawled out in my lap with his legs all open. <laughs> he's like totally... Um, let me find it Totally. It feels totally safe. So, under the history and construction of the Arizute, which is in this book, chapter 3, okay, um, we can see... Um, I'm going to read what I actually said here. I had also immersed myself in ceremonial and shamanic magical practices and spiritual alchemy for many years with great effect. Finally, I had studied many Eastern-based psychologists, such as Siddha Yoga, Kashmir Shaivism, Taoism, Buddhism, and Hinduism and Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, which is important because this shows how in other places how they believe the same way about our thinking. It was important for me to realize that. I had heard over and over and over again, well that's the psychology of the East. It doesn't matter if it's the psychology of the East or the psychology of the West. The ideas become a part of these systems and I had to learn that. I learned that through this. Okay, um, uh, the Yoga Sutras focusing heavily upon the mental modifications, um, which is the Yoga Sutras 1.5 through 1.11. These things made great <coughs> sense to me in understanding how these things really exposed uh, to me that my mind was working against me through these mental modifications. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about how these mental modifications, we get information, we believe a certain way based on that, and it modifies how we think. It modifies how we behave. So um, we're wanting to change our behavior. We're wanting to change the pattern. And in that, we're able to change the way we feel to how we want to feel. Okay, so um, I had already discovered the conception of vignas, i.e. obstacles. That's all a vigna is. A vigna was an obstacle in my mental modification. So I, I'm working right here. I'm talking about how I was mentally working on myself as a magical practice, preparing for the Arzutain. Um I had already come to the same conclusion as many of the great Eastern psychologists that if one is able to first identify these obstacles, these mental modifications, these skandhas, one would be able to achieve true self-realization. Once one was able to know of these subtle influences upon how one thinks, then they could choose to remove or overcome these. I would then learn about Dr. Thomas Hora and metapsychiatry, about Albert Ellis and his rational emotive behavioral therapy, also known as REBT. Ellis had formulated a whole cognitive psychology based upon the philosopher Epictetus. Like myself, he was able to build off philosophical insights. That's what I loved about REBT. When I began to read Albert Ellis, and not just the, the A, B, C, D, E, F model, but I was able to read his words. I was able to see he had taken a philosophy and he had said, wow, if I'm able to apply myself to this idea, my life will be so much better. 
And this is what he found. This is the, the quote from the philosopher, okay? You know. What disturbs men's mind is not events, but their judgments on events. Epictetus. So the basis of his whole psychology was based on the understanding of this statement. See, I was working really hard to not focus on his ex anymore. We were working very hard to say nothing. Um, and we were working very hard to get out to where we could just change the, over the kid without having any interaction at all, other than what was, and what would be important, like was she sick? Did she have medication that needed to come from house to house? Um, you know, what happened with the doctors, period. You know, um, the child's been sick for four freaking months, ever since her mom, ever since her mom got her back every other week, she's been sick. And before that, she wasn't always sick. So, you know, um, that's a, there's something, I mean, you know, some of it I think is just the house because I think there was a meth lab in the downstairs apartment. Let's not get off on a tangent on that, please. But I was working to not have her the central focus of my reality so that I could enjoy my day doing what I like to do with Mark. And we were getting there. And then she began attacking even more because she wasn't getting through. So... So we need to RBT more. That's what it comes down to. Well, now we've got when to go we stop our be <laughs> When we stop REBTing, then we end up with that. Now, this, this next part is what that is talking about, okay? I was able to include the many cognitive distortions. Now, in our other book, which is the workbook of Babylon, we go over these cognitive distortions. And what's important is we all have these. Every human being has cognitive distortions. Okay? Even so, <laughs> I was able to include the many cognitive distortions that we all have in our mind. These were the same as the vignas, the obstacles, that I wanted to identify and I was able to study these distortions and witness how everyone had these. And that was important because when I first began, I thought this was unique to me. I'm the only one that has these problems. I'm the only one that thinks this way. I was told, well, you think differently than other people. The implication was I was sick. I was mentally ill because of the way I thought. The reality of it was they're doing the same thing. They're just not addressing the beliefs, the irrational beliefs, the absolutes, um, the must bees which is what Ellis calls them. Uh, they're not addressing them. And instead, like I said, they were saying, wow, you're not, you don't think like I do, so you must be sick in the head. And I dealt with this for a long time. This became an obstacle until I said, until I came to the conclusion, everybody has these things. And now we're all leveled. Everybody is disturbed in one way or another. I don't care who they are. They have disturbances. They have mentally created disturbances for themselves. And it's because society's mentally ill. The, that the, was the, my whole point. Everybody. The society as a whole has got a mental illness that they don't address. It's become the norm to think, believe, and, and do this way. So if, when you can see that or realize that or acknowledge that, then what you know is, is that, um, that then, you're, then you realize it's not just you. 
and you're able to start to address what these other people won't and they resist they will fight you tooth or nail to not let you make these changes and to try to make it appear like you're not right and this is why it's important to apply the virtue of the magus keep silent right don't tell people what you're doing because they will try to oppose you. They don't and want you to Sizia, change. Your first daemon. They want you to stay in the same trap. They want to control you through the same trap. So we're talking about the basis of mental control. And a lot of people do it naturally. Irrationally, but they do it naturally. Their mind just does it. So when we look at these distortions... Right, like I reverted. What happened? Um, um, Mark was upset about some of the texts that I sent his ex. And I felt attacked. So what did I do? Instead of hearing what he was trying to say to me, I decided that he was like everybody else that had been in my life. And, um, and went into a victim role. That's what I did. And the next day, I told her, I don't blame her. I accept responsibility for my own behavior. But I was trying to explain to her how our communication can be taken, and it always is. It's always misunderstood, and it's always reinterpreted by another person, and it becomes something that we never intended it to be. That's because these mental modifications take over. We go into autopilot for most people. So if we try to judge people based on what we're talking about, that's going to run into a big difficulty. Because everybody does this, and everybody has mental modifications if they're a human being. That's what Patanjali says. Everybody has these mental modifications. And then it becomes, um, when you look at these things, when you look at your own beliefs and you read something in a book, you could say, "Wow, that that is way out of well, line." Well, it's it's. Or wow, I that's feel, right on the right I on the money. I feel this way because, and then, you state out, "Okay, he doesn't, he doesn't hear me. He doesn't care. He says he's going to change, and he doesn't change." Okay, so there's only a certain amount that you can change about something outside of yourself. So. You have to say, okay, I'm going to choose to do this differently to get away from this behavior in him that I know is not going to change. Because I'm going to try to set a boundary. If it doesn't work, then what do I have to do? I have to ignore the door. I have to be rude. I have to be whatever. But I'm going to try to set a boundary in an appropriate way. I'm going to try to get the respect I feel like we deserve. Well, you don't have to be rude. I mean, well, I right. had a teacher, and my teacher, he was a Zen master, and um, nothing made him mad. He never got mad. I never remember the, in the nine years he was teaching me meditation, insight meditation, everything that I needed to know. He never got angry. It's not because he didn't feel anger. He saw anger as the the rea as a reaction to cowardice. That's how he saw it. He would become upset if he became angry. So he had learned through meditation not to give into this, not to react to that thing that irritates you and and makes you angry but to look deeper into your own belief system. Now, in the Arzutain, I talk about this realization I had through an ethics class I took. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, when we talk about having a life worth living, we're talking about examining our life. We're talking about examining how we're affected by the our mind, primarily. We have to train our mind. Happiness comes through training our mind. Our mind won't let us be happy. 
it's not equipped that way. It doesn't work that way. Right. So we have to overcome this. We have to realize that the examined life, this is what I did as a philosopher, I turned it around. I reversed it. And I said the examined life then is a life worth living. And I found that examination within the word evaluation. So we go back to REBT. Okay, we go back to A, the activating event, the belief, B, the consequences, C, D, D, important. We dispute it. We dispute how we believe in it, what we believe. And then E, we evaluate and we eliminate it. Right. It loses power when we evaluate it, when we examine it. So I'm, we're not telling you that you're going to be able to change him, or you're going to. We we are only telling you that you're going to be able to change how you think about. You're going to be able to change you, and you're going to change how you feel about the situation. And he's going to see that things that used to bother you, things that used to get under your skin, they don't do it anymore. They don't get under your skin anymore. You don't care anymore. He doesn't get the effect that he once got by doing to those behaviors you. to control you. Right. Because. That does happen. People become um, tyrannical and controlling if through these absolute sick, beliefs. Then he can keep control of the children. Right. If he can keep you functioning and sicker. Or even the belief, you know, I'm of the, I, you know, I, when I went to school, and I don't go to school, I, w I was kicked out of school because they did away with my degree program. It wasn't anything that I did. They evaluated whether or not they were going to give funding for this degree program anymore. And they found that most of the people that signed up for this degree program, which was an, an applied psychology degree, they didn't want to pay for it anymore. Because this is me. I would have been a psychologist like Freud or Jung or anybody else. I would have internalized it and created my own psychology. And they're afraid of that. They don't want a new psychology. They want to keep people sick. They don't want, when I did a report in school on REBT, they didn't want me to do a report on it. They asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, because I find this psychology to be the most effective. Yeah, but it doesn't keep us in business. Right. It, gets you it well. doesn't keep us in business. This thing goes right to the root of the problem and roots it out. There's no talking therapy. There's no delays. There's no blaming this one or that one. It's, it's, it's so direct. It's shocking. Do you think we should shock our patients? And I said, yeah. If it comes down to them being able to change at the root, I think it's the most effective and necessary psychology. Right. to be applied in our society. And they don't want it applied in society. And then right after that, I get removed from the program. Yep. I got removed from the program. And when I said... Because I was too good of a psychologist. And when I said... I didn't said, want people... I want to get this out, please, okay? okay? I, I was too good as a psychologist. I wasn't falling into their bullshit. And I'm talking about my educators, the school, whatever. I wasn't falling into their bullshit. They didn't like that. They couldn't control me. So they kicked me out of school. They didn't like my papers in my psychology class because I didn't agree with the people that I was being told were the experts. Right. I had the same problem. I didn't agree with Floyd. I disputed everything Floyd said in my papers. And it was I had to drop psychology. I had already graduated alcohol and drug abuse counseling school when I was working on a degree in, in social work. I was going for my uh, first of bachelor's and I wanted to be an MSW. And they didn't like what I had to say. 
and she said she was very disappointed in my papers that she thought she was going to get so much more out of me because of my the fact that I was an actual LADAC <coughs> licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor and that I worked in the field and um, I got blackballed out of the uh, therapeutic community because of my beliefs and uh, as a result um, I went in somewhere else to make money well you know I was a stripper for a decade after that because I couldn't get a job in my in the area because I'd been blackballed for what they didn't consider to be correct way of treatment so I was trying to make a point not necessarily about myself, but about society. We have this paradigm within our society of sickness. We have a paradigm that says we're completely diseased and we can never change. And we have this new paradigm that arose through medicine, psychology, discovery, science, that we, this is not a permanent thing that we are able to heal ourselves. Think for ourselves. They don't want us to think for They ourselves. don't want us to be able to heal ourselves. Or think. Okay. If you look at some of these self-help programs, they don't teach you how to heal yourself. They teach you how to accept your lot. That's it. You're going to be sick and you're going to be this way for the rest of your life. Okay. I encourage you to look at the healing paradigm, to look at the nature, the neurology of the mind. This is what I studied. The mind re replicates and changes. So we I learned amazing things that you can literally change yourself by these things. I went and did something revolutionary for myself. I mean, I th through my professors, I said, well, I suffer from these various mental disorders, and I have this idea. And I told them the idea. And they said, well, that's revolutionary. It might actually work. Why don't you try it? Why don't you try it under observation? So I went to my therapist, and I said, I really want to try this. I don't think it's ever been done before. He said, well, I think it could work, but I'd like you to go to downtown. I'd like you to be reevaluated to prove that it did work. So at the time when I went into treating myself as I decided to, okay, and, um, I, and I was successful, within three months I went back for a reevaluation and the neurology of my brain, the neurochemistry had changed. I had changed it all. So when they tried to evaluate me and find these symptoms to diagnose me for this, that, and the other thing, they, they found they couldn't do it. My brain had changed. So what I was studying was proven to be effective. And it showed me why they were afraid of it. It showed me a lot of other things, but it showed me, most importantly, why they were afraid of it. Because I had gone to mental health, I had these issues, I came up with this idea to treat myself. I treated myself. Now, they had been treating me for years with this talk therapy and everything else. That does and no it, good. And it never worked. It never works. I would tell them that by talking about these things over and over and over again, it just, it just A, it, it, it causes me to, to, to freeze up. I don't want to talk anymore, okay? Or B, um, this talk therapy just reinforces, it tries to make us believe that this is a normal thing and that we I, went through in life. I worked in multiple personality units for a while during my internship. Right. And... Um, was, and I can teach you about the mind, And it's Misty. part of how you said, how did you know I, that you were someone else? And and I can I can tell you, you even physically look different in your pictures when you start changing. And I can see when you become the male wind. Or I can see when you're raven or rivers. 
um, as she's the protective mother and uh, one who's going to dominate for the children. And I can see when you're the frustrated one who doesn't want to fight anymore and is just angry. Um, and that's why we, I worked with you on this to to find out what type, what psychological type you are. I that's who you are. Not these other things, right. but that psychological type is who you really are. And I believe that with REBT therapy, I believe that you can eliminate the circumstances that are the reason that you feel you have to switch so that you can yes. become all one, one total of all of these personalities together instead of having to have them splintered. And I, I, had an I ex. think you can do this. I had an ex, okay? She had multiple personality disorder. She had about four or five, maybe six personalities. I told her some about that already. And um, I worked with her with this, what we're talking about. I worked with her on REBT. I worked, she was a Satanist, and um, she ascribed to a lot of their beliefs, and I said, well, rather than just accept them, why don't you challenge how you believe according to these beliefs? And she found after that, she couldn't accept it anymore. She could see through what they were trying to tell her, what they were trying to program her to be. I talked to my wife recently about this. One of the nine satanic principles is we're just an animal. No, we're not. Right. So they're trying to get us to deny our intellectual nature, our reasoning nature, so they can control us. So the, the Church of Satan... Even though I consider myself a Satanist because I believe, well, I love Lucifer who fell for me to be free. I don't believe in these beliefs that I'm nothing more than an animal or that I'm supposed to run out and have sex with everybody uh, or child sacrifice or any of these other sectimented things. That is not what Satanism is to me. And I don't follow the Satanic path in that light. I just see it as freedom, freedom to think for myself, freedom to stand up for what I value, nothing more. It, it's really that simple for me. Um, I, I don't believe that we need to harm someone else to better ourselves or any of those things. Um, well, that was one of the things about her, my ex, is when she would get stressed out, and she would get stressed pretty easily. She would switch to another personality. Right. And I think that's happening to you a lot. And I, and, and, I, and I think the trigger for the switch is a survival trigger. I think it's a survival mechanism. And I think a lot of multiple personality is a person is incapable at that time of... of going through whatever they're going through. So they switch to another personality which is more dominant and that personality might be stronger, might be the one that carries all the other personalities. Well, she said Missy's a wimp and can't take care of things. Right, which is generally the case. That's where fragmentation comes from. So what so what you what you need to do, what we were talking about before on top of the REBT is go back to looking at your personality type. I know you're going to be distracted. Your personality type wants you to study all personality types. It's I want prone. You to slow down. It's almost prone to multiple personality I want you to slow disorder. down. That's why I'm not putting up the next section for you. I want right. you to work on these because I feel like you're orphaned because you were adopted and other things. I feel like it's very really dominant for you, so I want you to. And I have a and I have a really strong orphan. His mother really. is a very strong orphan. She was adopted. You know, and and, and I and away. I and I think that pattern was learned from my mother. Right. 
you know. I was I, a lost child, so I have a very strong orphan that needs to be this victim. And I keep trying to revert back into that role. I was about ready to storm out the door and leave my husband. I don't want to leave him. I love him, you know. I, but I, I let that role start taking over for me, and I didn't need to. And, you know, and then I had to just go sit and not talk and gather myself. And, but I think that you can gather yourself by taking, if you're writing down all of your thoughts and you already BT them all, we can work you out of this pattern the same as I'm doing for myself. And I see it. I don't like to see it. I don't like to see that I'm responsible, but I am. And that's important, cause and effect, okay? Important, the most important lesson you can learn in magic, cause and effect. You're responsible for what your magic does. Yeah. It's You're responsible for it. What you think. Not some God. What you believe. Not some the pattern. you take. You. Cause and effect. And we do things that happen and they, <coughs> and they cause certain changes. And sometimes we're not even aware that we're doing it. Okay? We just do it all the time. It becomes natural. What I'm asking you to do is see the cause and effect. So if we can look into why you think the way you think, R-E-B-T, we can begin to see the cause and effect. The That's why I keep cause saying to you, and effect. break it down. You're, over, you're generalizing. Don't generalize. You need to get more specific about each instant, each whatever. And generalizing is a cognitive distortion. Right. It's one of the many distortions, like black and white thinking. It has to be this way, or it has to be that no. way. No. That is black and white thinking. Right. And or it has to be all or none. nothing. Another, another cognitive distortion. Right. So these distortions, okay, are, are shown for what they are when we begin working with REBT. And we say, wow, the, this distortion, this is, this is so distorted this belief, why is it like this? And then we come across the list of distortions and we say, wow, I do that all the time. Right. Well, that's one of the reasons why I'm always disturbed because I do this all the time. You know, if I stop doing this, then what's gonna happen? You know, think of it in the sense of uh, people, two people get together, they have different belief systems. Immediately what happens is one person tries to impose their belief system, tries to convert the other person to believe the same way that they believe. The other person has their own belief system and there's a conflict. There's never any uh, connection. Okay, well you can have your belief system. I respect that you have a belief and if you know you respect that I have a belief. It generally doesn't get to that point. It gets to the all or nothing thinking. You either believe the way I believe or get the hell out of my life, okay? Or you either believe one side or the other, I'm over here, and if you don't believe over here, get the hell out of my life. In my case, I'm, I, I am a moderate, I'm in between. I'm in between this side, the, the the, the extreme on this side and I'm in between the extreme on this side so I'm really strange to a lot of people because I'm in the middle I tell them go the middle way go the middle path they don't even know go what I'm talking they don't even really know what I'm talking about go directly to yourself go directly to source so through the middle way basically we're refining everything that we did in the church of Babylon workbook we're taking it to the next level. We're taking it at a deepening level. We're taking it in deeper. Right. Because those We're things that we originally deeper. taught, I don't think people understand that. They, they don't understand this. I had him around the clock. But these things that were taught... You guys didn't. Are, were very 
are very effective and um, they're very deep they can be unpacked I mean I I dealt with surf a lot of the surface stuff but they can be completely unpacked and the more you unpack them the more refined you become and you, you know, know I think part of the reason that you are one of the only ones who's really trying to work it like we are is because you really want your life to be better and you really I think it's because she's a witch She's a real witch. I think it's because she's a real witch. I think when she listens to me, she hears a real witch. When she listens to you, she hears a real witch. Right. You know? And, um... I think these other people, um, they, they... It's very difficult to look at yourself. It's very difficult to say, I'm responsible. And they don't want to do that. And this is what we've lost. Yeah, they people think magic school. is the opposite of that. They, they want to They think go, magic is I can a wave God. a wand and I don't have to deal with any of this. Right. No. You, you do. You are creating through your beliefs, through your thoughts. That is the magic. You are the magic. It's yeah. not somewhere else. Right. You are it. And so if I believe he's an asshole because he calls me on my shit... Um, which I am. I am an asshole. You, you, you could do it nicer. <laughs> you could it's really, hard for me. Yeah, so you could say some of the things you say to me nicer. So that it's I hard for me. Have to I try to. I wall. try to explain to her, and it's not an excuse. I try to explain He's to her brutal. that <laughs> I am a system analyzer. I am too. That is what I do. I'm brutal. And too. I, I take people as a system. And I analyze it, how it can improve, how they can improve themselves. I mean, we're both. And they look at that as a serious privacy violation. They a lot of the time, I can see exactly what needs to be addressed. But as soon as I try to tell them what I see, it becomes offensive. It becomes attacking. Right. And what okay. happened with Clarissa? Because you know a little bit about that. Okay. Clarissa was celebrating a 10-year miscarriage of a baby of one of her daughters. Okay. I, it was a sensitive topic, very sensitive, because, you know, we, we value human life. So... Well, we value human life. Most people Most don't, people don't have any value. I mean, they for just feel like life. let's just go rip a, a, a full grown fetus out of a womb limb by limb and, and torture them to death. That's okay for some reason in our society today. But, um, but I wanted her to, to change the thinking because she says, I'm surrounded by death. I say, I, I say, you are surrounded by death all the time. There's someone with cancer. There's someone who just died. There's, it's constant. But what I wanted her to see was, was part of the reason that was the most prominent thing in her life is because that's what she seemed to give her attention to. But there's no sweet way to say that and not sound like you don't care. Right. And it's like me as a Thelemite, okay, I learned to revere and celebrate death. I don't right. mourn death. Right. People get freaked out by me because they come to me for sympathy in death. And I tell them that they should celebrate that person's life and how they remembered them Jesus. and realize that they're now a god. I mean, are we going to grieve a baby that didn't? we didn't even get to know for 10 years I mean sure I mean like I mean do we have an anniversary for every death that we've ever experienced I mean um, I don't even want to remember when my father died I know it was somewhere around Thanksgiving you know but I can't I don't want to I miss my father sure I loved him very much, but we all are going to die. It, it's a part of life. So, do I want to be sad every year <coughs> on the day that he died? Do I want that to be my reality? I think morbid is 
do I want to be comes morbid? To mind. Yeah, morbid. Do I, mean, I want to be morbid? A lot of people focus on death because, in essence, they're saying, my life changed. I don't know why it changed. This person that I love is now gone. Um, and so they're looking for sympathy, they're looking for pity. Why is and there a need to focus on constant death and sickness and illness? Why? So this was my point. It's not that I don't understand caring about people. It's why does this have to be the central focus of your life? Because if you, as long as you're focusing on that, you're not focusing on you. And the thing with Clarissa is she doesn't focus on her. Focus She's always on focused on everybody else. And that's why we're trying to get you to to do okay. REPT, to, to, to deal with you. Right. Okay, because we can get lost in the other person. We can get lost in all these outside things. Right. And the journey's within. And we're distracted from the journey, which is inside of us. It's a part of us. We can be lied to and said, well, the journey's out here. You know, we got to go enjoy life. And that's the journey. No, That's I not can the be journey. just as content. The journey is inside of you. It's interior. Right. And with death, the thing is, a thelemite, what I realized about death, and I learned this through uh, theosophy, Peruker says that death, Peruker is a professor in theosophy, very, very, very intelligent, wise man. Um, it's one of the books me and Mark are he reading said together right now. He said death is a change in form. That's all it is. And it took the sting out of it for me. It, death became change. Everything dies. Everything changes. And our desire to uh, an attachment to impermanent for, for impermanent things to be permanent is what causes us to suffer. Okay? I just thought I had to get enough rapport with her I could talk to her and help her and her not take take it offensively. And I have known her almost as long as I've known you, Misty. I did not think she would react this way to me and it broke my heart because I love her dearly. So I felt betrayed. I gave a heart and soul to the Church of Babylon to share it with all of you because I love you. And that happens in the crap too, because when I tell people oh, in your in and I your feel when I say, well, you, in the second phase you have to die, people rebel against me. They're like, what do you mean I have to? Okay, die? here's one. Here's you an know? RGBT. I feel betrayed because people won't do their homework and they won't do the assignments. Okay, so if I change my thinking. These people don't read, they don't do their assignments because it's too painful to look at themselves. And it's no longer about me anymore. And I don't have to feel betrayed anymore. There's a simple, there's a simple way. So we do it all day long. Every thought. Every belief. Because it's not my fault they won't do their schoolwork. It's not my fault they don't see what we're showing. I tried to explain to you not everybody's on the same level. And they and may even not though, even be capable of doing it. That's, and even that's though thing. and even though I can present it, the the reason why I could present it, Misty, is because I did it. We've I both lived done it. it. I mean I lived it. What are the odds that we meet seven states apart? We've both studied so much of the same things. Him at more depth level than I I even come close to. But the fact that we both had the same type of majors, we both understood drug addiction, we both understood how to overcome and beat that uh, in our own way, which isn't the way that they tell you to, um, that we um, both had REBT training, we both, I mean, there was just so many things. I mean, I mean, he really is my twin. It's not a bullshit. It's not a lie. And we can fight like oh my god we could almost kill each other because we are so freaking much alike and we're judgers we're in, we're thinkers and judgers and we're INTJs right we're we're in, both we're we're introverted we're intuitive intuitive we are 
judgers and thinkers. And thinkers. So we're, excuse me, we're thinkers and then we're judges. So we think something through and then we, judge. and then we make a discernment, we a judgment. <laughs> we don't necessarily just blame. It's also, uh, you know, it's a dismissive thing too for me at times. I'll listen to somebody. It's a personality somebody, type that rubs I'll talk, people the wrong way. Oh, it, it is. It's one of the rarest, just like yours, it's one of the rarest and they hate us. Because this is something that we have the same personality type, and I'm trying to explain to her. Well, when I when I criticize, it's not to tear you down; it's to build you up. And I'm the same way. And I was like that with my son. And I but think others my don't son, understand that. About my me. son has made it into I think for himself that me telling what I told him was to help him better himself not put him down, not make him feel less than about himself. But I think that through maybe going to my stepfather, who was a therapist, he probably said some of the things I said, and my stepfather probably took it and turned it into me uh, bashing him down instead of trying to make him change or trying to get him to see so he could change. My son is as high-functioning in his autism because I was direct all the time. Because if I wasn't direct, he didn't get it. You, you couldn't beat around the bush and say it in a nice way. You had to just say, look, that behavior is weird. And if you do that, people are gonna look at you like you're weird and they're not gonna wanna be around you. I had to just be very straightforward to the point. You know, um, no, it was not appropriate for him to get his friends to all watch porn and then come shove it in his mother's face. That is not normal behavior. Direct. It is not normal to talk about that you like to watch porn and jerk off around the clock. Not appropriate. People don't need to know that about you. Private. <laughs> you know. Right. Um, he has a bipolar tendency to with the autism and I think he had hypomania sometimes and I think it gave him an extremely high sex drive that he didn't know how to control and he was functioning without medication and he was doing very well so if he beat off it was none of my business I just try to knock on the door before and make sure he said come in before I entered his room you know, so, um, so these things, you know, we just do the best we can do. Um, I try to teach him how to have mundane conversation with people to be able to talk about appropriate things. Ask them what school they go to. Ask them how old they are. Ask them what they want to go to college for. You know. I, I literally had to teach him. I, I sat around a table, the kitchen table, playing board games to teach him how to interact with other children because he didn't know how to interact. He didn't know how to play a game um, and stay focused or, uh, you know. So these were things that, that we did to help build skills. And you see all of his friends on my page they know I was training my son how to have a normal life to the best that he could with his disabilities. So, um, I got a little off topic, didn't I? A little bit. <laughs> and she does that a lot. I, I, but it also plays into what we're talking about. It always, there's always a connecting tie to what we're talking about. And if you look at the nature of REBT, Again, you have a, a child, an autistic child, doesn't have a strong connection emotionally. No. And a lot of it ha comes down to an appearance, you know. And that's what they're trying to, to say in society. They're trying to say these people are dangerous because they can watch a video game, they can play a video game, and that video game to them is teaching them how real life should be. And it's a video game. They can't distinguish between a video game and, and reality. reality. Right. My son, one of the things he yelled, he screamed at me was, 
I had to teach myself the proper facial expressions so to to appear like everyone else. Because right. he didn't feel like everyone else. He didn't have those emotions. But that's not just like that's not just him. If you take positive okay, if you take positive discipline, okay? Positive discipline I had to learn to teach to my daughter. I was trying to do this with her, but everybody began to interfere. Positive discipline is taking away corporal punishment. You don't hit the child anymore. It's, a, it's asking them, it's encouraging them through, self, through respect, okay? Right. Respect for others to change their behavior. But it only works through the parent having sufficiency, having self-sufficiency. <coughs> so I, my job is to mirror when she does these, these um, four uh, goals that don't work. Okay, these goals are acting to seek for undue attention, um, acting on a power trip, ego or power trip, acting for revenge, or acting like she can't do it herself. She needs to have somebody do it for Feigning her. Feigning inadequacy. Feigning inadequacy. We doing? all do these things. The right. thing I realized when I was researching positive discipline was that we all do it, even adults. If we're not taught a different way, we continue using these patterns, these destructive patterns. Now, in, in positive discipline, what makes it effective is the parent has to be able to, to reflect to the child, mirror reflect, you did this, this is my emotional response to what you're doing. So they learn by observing that. The problem is most parents don't do this. They don't well, mirror that to the child. The only emotion I was taught to show growing up was anger. Which See, anger is the anger only thing a here. secondary emotion. Right. So I'm it's a like, masking emotion. Right. I'm gonna. I'm angry because you're not doing this, and that was probably my biggest flaw as a parent. Was that I didn't show hurt, or I didn't show. Right. And I would just, say that not just not just callousie. That's everybody. That's everybody. They have a problem with the, with doing that. Okay. And what I found is people are like, well, what is that gonna do? Well, it's going to change her behavior. But they're attached to this behavior modification that everybody believes in. Everybody believes human beings can be modified by um, praise or blame. And it's unhealthy. The carrot and stick. Well, if you act this way, I'm going to give you this, positive or negative reinforcement. We're talking about human beings here. They're not animals. Okay. Daniel Pink says we need we need to tap into that next drive that this biological drive and the drive to get them through reinforcement to do what we want them to do breaks down at a certain point and this is what parents have have not been told so they use this positive and negative reinforcement to their own detriment eventually it, they, the child rebels against them because they're not an animal and they begin to be able to think for themselves as they grow a little older they will be able to think for themselves and they'll be able to say well I've always done this because of this reinforcement you know and they begin to question that so I wanted positive to use positive discipline but others wanted to use the social engineering of positive and negative reinforcement, which is not the same thing. If the child sees that they hurt you by their behavior, and they see that you're sad, they know what sad is, and they didn't want to make you sad, then they're going, you, that encourages them to change their behavior. 
okay? And this idea, these tools are important. And it's important to see them as a tool. You know, we have many tools. I, I, I have many tools that I learned in my path. My teacher was, oh man, he wasn't a tyrant. I love him, okay? But he was an INTJ, just like me and Callisee. He was an INTJ, and um, in some instances, that was really good. In other instances, not so much, because he would systematically, uh, he was just brutal. And maybe that's also where I get what I do with other people. And so I need to look at that, you know, I need to keep REBTing uh, my own, you know, belief system. So I hope this video helps you. I'm sorry we got a little bit off track, you know, we always tend to do that. But um, I really hope that this video helps you. Um, REBT has helped me so much in my life, you know. Uh, it has given me so much power back in my life to to um, be able to see the causes and be able to work on them and realize I'm the cause and I'm the and and I it's the reason why the effect occurred you know um, so do you got anything else to say hon no just I love you all right we love you uh, and uh, feel free to ask questions about the video. I know at certain points I, I'm not I'm not talking to you through a script. This is me as a human being. You know I don't have any. You know yeah, it, we're real. it could be jumping around a little bit, but I think we've talked about the things that really matter in this video, and it'll help you get started. And I, um, I would also encourage you to research it, to look and see if you can find material. For myself, I learned through immersion, really great. That's why I apply videos, I apply different mediums to learning. And I think this is important because if we don't do that, we don't learn the depth that we learn at. We only learn the surface, you know, and that's a form of their control. They want you to stay on the surface, you know, whereas we're encouraging you to look, to immerse yourself in the depth of um, things. So, all right, love is the law, love under will. Have a great day. Bye. Say bye.